And he's like, I do not care about the ephemeral things. And he's like, well, what does that mean, ephemeral? Said the little prince who never in his life had let go of a question once he asked it. It means, which is in danger of speedy disappearance? Is my flower in danger of speedy disappearance? Certainly it is. My flower is ephemeral? The little prince said to himself, and she has only four thorns to defend herself against the world. And I have left her on my planet all alone. That was my first moment of regret. That was his first moment of regret, the little prince, but he took courage once more. What place would you advise me to visit now? The planet Earth, replied the geographer. It has a good reputation. Then the little prince went away thinking about his flower. And then the planet Earth. It is not just an ordinary planet. One can count there. 111 kings, not forgetting to be sure the Negro kings among them. 7,000 geographers, 900,000 businessmen, 7.5 million tipplers, 311 million conceited men, that is to say about 2 billion grown-ups. To give you an idea of the size of Earth, I'll tell you that before the invention of electricity, it was necessary to maintain over the whole of the six continents a veritable army of 462, 511 lamp lighters for the street lamps. <laughs> so there are lamp lighters, right? So then he, he then he reaches Earth. Okay. So there's a couple more quotes. He talks about life and love. He's okay. He has this flower, right? And it's 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 all imaginary, but he's got he lives on this planet, um, you know, and it's got it has uh, volcanoes on it, and it's got a flower, uh, one flower, and he was like, you know, couldn't wait for it to bloom, and he kept watching it, and then eventually it got the courage, and then it just blooms out real bright, and then he was like, oh, you're beautiful, and she was like, oh, thank you, but the first word she says, yes, I am beautiful, and look, she looks at the sun. The sun is born the same time as me. <laughs> so talk about conceited, right? So the little prince, uh, he's talking about the uh, rose garden. He goes, people where you live, the little prince said, grow 5,000 roses in one garden. Yet, they don't find what they're looking for. They don't find it, I answered. And yet, what they're looking for could be found in a single rose or a little water. Of course, I answered. The little prince added, but eyes are blind. You have to look with the heart. It is a time... Is the time you have wasted for your rose that makes your rose so important. The most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or touched. They are felt with the heart. It also describes men and female relationships. The shrub soon stopped growing and began to get ready to produce a flower. The little prince, who was present at the first appearance of a huge bud, felt at once that some sort of miraculous apparition must emerge from it, but the flower was not satisfied to complete the preparations for her beauty in the shelter of her green chamber. She chose her colors with the greatest care. She dressed herself slowly. She adjusted her petals one by one. She did not wish to go out into the world all rumpled like the field poppies. It was only in the full radiance of her beauty that she wished to appear. Oh yes, she was a coquettish creature, and her mysterious adornment lasted for days and days. Then one morning, oh, exactly at sunrise, she suddenly, suddenly showed herself. After working with all this painstaking precision, she yawned and said, Ah, oh, I am scarcely awake. I beg that you will excuse me. My petals are all disarranged. But the little prince could not restrain his admiration. Oh, how beautiful you are. Am I not? The flower responded sweetly, and I was born at the same moment as the sun. <laughs> Oh boy, okay. The little prince could guess easily enough that she was not any too modest, but how moving and exciting she was. I think it is time for breakfast, she added an instant later. If you would have the kindness to think of my needs. And the little prince, completely abashed, went to look for a sprinkling can of fresh water. So he tended the flower. So too, she began very quickly to torment him with her vanity, which was, if the truth be known, a little difficult to deal with. One day, for instance, when she was speaking of her four thorns, she said to the little prince, Let the tigers come with their claws. There are no tigers on my planet, the little prince objected. And anyways, tigers do not eat weeds. I am not a weed, the flower replied sweetly. Oh, please excuse me. And I am not at all afraid of tigers, she went on. But I have a horror of drafts. I suppose you wouldn't have a scream for me. A horror of drafts? That's bad luck for a plant, remarked the little prince and added to himself, this flower is a very complex creature. At night, I want you to put me under a glass globe. It is very cold where you live, in the place where I came from. But she interrupted herself at that point. She had come in the form of a seed. She could not have known anything other uh, could not have known anything of other worlds. Embarrassed over having let herself be caught in the verge of such a naive untruth, she coughed two or three times in order to put the prince in the wrong. The screen. 
I was just going to look for it when you spoke to me. Then she forced her cough a little more so that he should suffer from a more remorse just the same. So the little prince, in spite of all the goodwill that was inseparable from his love, had soon come to doubt her. He had taken seriously the words which were without importance, and it made him very unhappy. I ought not to have listened to her, he confided, uh, he confided to me one day. I ought not... One never ought to listen to the flowers. One should simply look at them and breathe their fragrance. Mine perfumed all my planet, but I did not know how to take pleasure in all her grace. This tale of claws which disturbed me so much should only have filled my heart with tenderness and pity. And he continued his confidences. The fact is that I did not know how... I, the fact is, I did not know how to understand anything. I ought to have judged by the deeds and not by the words. Finishing up with the little prince, um, he's finally figuring out about his rose. Kind of about womankind in a way too. His rose is real conceited. He loves her, right? And yet she makes him suffer when she's in the wrong, when she says something silly. She had uh, claimed that the tiger, her thorns, her four little thorns, right? she's just a rose, will, will be able to fight all the tigers. And, um, and then later on she is like, uh, it is real cold here. I, I, the draft is really bad. Where I came from, she's talking about where she had came from, but she didn't come from anywhere because she was a seed when she arrived on the planet, so she couldn't have known anything else. And yet she's like, you know, can you please get that glow? Please, please get my uh, glass glow. So, um, eventually he felt sad about it, and he said, uh, he leaves. He leaves the planet because, you know, he just doesn't understand what it is that she wants. And he says, I ought not to have listened to her, he confided to me one day. One ought, one never ought to listen to the flowers. One should simply look at them and breathe their fragrance. Mine perfumed all my planet, but I did not know how to take pleasure in all her grace. This tale of claws which disturbed me so much should only have filled my heart with tenderness and pity. And he continued his confidences. The fact is that I did not know how to understand anything. I ought to have judged by deeds and not by words. She cast her fragrance and her radiance over me. I ought never to have run away from her. I ought to have guessed all the affection that lay behind her poor little stratagems. Flowers are so inconsistent, but I was too young to know how to love her. It actually does make me think of um, a woman, Miss Hester, at, uh, in Vermont. There's a, a boys' camp there that I had worked. I was a counselor there. And there's a dickhead counselor. There's so many contradictions in, in I got it, kings, right? Just a bunch of fake fascists and shit. I'm the king. Do as I say. Um, but there's a... Um, I don't know, there was a woman there, and she was like real stuck up, and I just didn't want to hang out with her, I was just kind of, I didn't make, she didn't make any sense to me, and it seemed like I was putting everything on the line in order to be with her, and she just basically, you know, had a fleeting, oh yeah, do whatever you want to do, and it's kind of like, damn, I absolutely love you, I absolutely adore you, and you could get, barely give a shit about me, and so, I don't know, I mean, this is, it's beautiful in a way, and yet it's kind of not so beautiful, I wish there was more equality, and if, you know, flowers can make that type of mistake and still receive love, then I think the little prince should receive the same love. Um, he made a mistake too, yet she should have said, hey, no, I want you to stay, I don't want you to leave, don't, don't leave, you know, I, I love you too, I love you taking care of me. But she couldn't say that, because she just liked all the, taking all the love, and then making him feel like shit. Um, there was one woman also, I'll mention this, in social movements class, and I appreciated that she did this because I could tell that she liked me. And every time I talked to her, she'd just be a flutter, right? Um, but I had mentioned in like one of the first classes that we needed a revolution. And then there's a bunch of gasp. You know, it was, a, it was a class full of women. They're like, oh my God. And it's bullshit, okay? Women get away with any fucking thing and every fucking thing. Um, I did read, um, you know, there's domestic violence and rape. And these have been issues historically and all around the world. And they're important issues. There was that one girl... Um, in Pakistan that got shot in the head because she wanted to uh, pursue her education and she's remarkable she is so brilliant god the things that comes out of her mouth is she's a genius okay and um and so yeah there's there's that but this is America in America women have jobs and women are going to college they're doing better than everybody everybody loves women women love women men love women but no one gives a shit about a man my god if I and this is important to understand this is important to know if you're a young man growing up 
No one gives a shit about you, okay? No one cares. No one's just going to fall in love with your face or, you know, with your butt or with your body and take care of you. They're not going to do that. That will never happen. Um, maybe if you're gay, uh, that could happen. But in general, a heterosexual man, uh, every heterosexual relationship I've ever seen, if you're the man, you lose, right? Just like this poor little prince, which he didn't understand. He said, I was too young to know how to love her. And so in a way, I think of Miss Hester from this uh, Vermont camp because I had pursued a woman that was working in the uh, the girls' camp and yet I, I you know I, I got upset with how she her lack of affection for me and then later on she read one of the letters that I had written her and she wanted me to come back to Georgia but um, yeah I don't know I got I got some confidence issues right now the the LMPD messed up my face and so it's actually I'm so insecure about it they completely altered my entire existence and it's um and my breathing, I have health problems, right? I breathe differently now. And for what? Walking down the street and running into a bunch of assholes. So, you know, the, uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe she wouldn't give a shit, but I, women could be just as superficial as men, right? So, so yeah, I've, I've changed a little bit. Um, as a man, I feel as though I want a progressive woman. I want a woman that I'll be able to talk with intellectually. I hope to get equality, but I think eventually as time wears on, eventually my love for her will, will, will just trump kind of over everything and therefore I'll, you know, just be a slave. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be the victim of her whims, just like this poor little prince. But... It's a good story, and it's a good introduction. It uh, shows how the adults are ridiculous. It talks about life and love, and he was right. He loved the flower, and he shouldn't have listened to her when she said, you know, you should leave. He should have stayed. And now I'm kind of thinking maybe I should go to Georgia. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I'm in, a, I'm in a, a process of learning myself. So I think instead of actually uh, regretting anything, I need to just be more aware and just kind of understand um you know, life and love and relationships as, uh, you know, as, as this life just keeps on trucking on. Okay, so, number seven, Hope for the Flowers. Hope for the Flowers is uh, uh, one of my favorite books. This reminds me of a woman named Sharon, and actually her brother named Kevin um, at Xavier University, and she was gorgeous, I mean, when I think about her now, like, I don't know, I mean, I guess... The, she was gorgeous. She was beautiful, and yet I, I, I didn't. You know, I listened to her, and I probably shouldn't have. Uh, she fragranced all over, you know, my planet, and I loved being around her. Uh, but she didn't make any sense, and she tried to get with me. But um, hope for the flowers. We went on some sort of um, organic um, uh, farm, some little thing where you walk around things and think about things and meditate. I don't know. <laughs> I was somewhere in Ohio, I was Xavier University, Cincinnati. So, we went on this field trip, we checked out this place, and there was a bookstore there, and the bookstore had Hope for the Flowers, and I flipped through that book real fast, and just fell in love with it, and absolutely uh, adored it. Basically, it it um, it attacks capitalism, it's revolutionary, it shows this, uh, a, a striped caterpillar and a yellow caterpillar who find each other, fall in love, and they're, you know, sort of enjoying each other's bodies, and they just keep on tumbling around, but eventually the striped caterpillar gets tired of just, you know, just kind of being with the other person, and so he wanted more, he wanted something more out of life, and he just didn't understand it, and he couldn't, it was an insatiable uh, uh, thirst that he just needed to quench, and so um, eventually he goes and joins the rat race, right, so it's a short read, it's like 50 pages or so, and it's mostly illustrations, so, you know, it's a good children's book, it goes real fast, um, yeah, her brother hated me, I remember that. So there's a caterpillar pillar that symbolizes the capitalism, okay? So that's where actually Stripe and Yellow meet. Um, Stripe is born, he's crawling around, he sees everybody else kind of going in one line, so he gets in line and starts following them, and then they're all piled on top of one another, and there's this caterpillar pillar. And he climbs up with the, everybody else is climbing up this pillar. And he's like, man, what's up there? I better climb up there with everybody else. And it was rough. Nobody gave a crap about anybody else. People was kicking and pushing. And it was just really rough. And he's just trying to move, maneuver on his way up there. But on the way up there, he catches a glimpse of the yellow caterpillar. And once he saw the yellow caterpillar, he realized how much he cared about her and how 
um, how silly the rat race of him crawling up this caterpillar was. And so eventually they agree to, uh, the yellow caterpillar feels the same and says, well, I can't really continue my quest either. So they, you know, they fall in love and they go off to the side and they're just enjoying each other's bodies and they're enjoying each other, having a good time. And um, the, uh, 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 the eventually, let's see, they fall in love and then, right, then he, um, the, he gets tired and, 